Hi everyone, Christy here, and today I want to ask whether we're doing Jesus wrong. What I mean by that is, in terms of the debate about an historical or mythical Jesus, it seems to me that it would be much better to use the idea of Jesus as a theory than as a conclusion. And in this video I want to explain how I see the debate happening and how I want to turn it on its head and have you try to think about the question from a different angle. The way that I want to frame the question of whether or not there was an historical or a mythical Jesus has to do with my perspective as a social scientist. And as a social scientist, our job is to advance knowledge. It's discover things, test theories, see whether or not we can provide better explanations for what we observe happening in the world. And so that is the perspective that I bring to the topic of um, a mythical or a historical Jesus. And that is the perspective I want to try to uh, create or encourage you to consider in this video. This is the way that I perceive the Jesus debate happening now. Someone makes an assertion about whether, about Jesus being um, an actual person in history or not, and then the way that people want to then debate it is they'll turn to the sources and start looking at the sources to determine whether or not we can conclude Jesus was an historical person. Here's the diagram that I created. And so we have the question, did Jesus exist? And then from that, there's a collection of evidence that mentions Jesus that becomes the focus of the discussion. So you'll have people who approach it from a scholarly position who everyone that I can see in biblical scholarship, in New Testament scholarship, in theological stuff, all the academics who are publishing are publishing from the th the perspective that the evidence we see is evidence of an historical Jesus. On the other side, you have people who have a mythical position. I don't want to uniformly attribute like just one view because I think there's a lot of different ways that you can see Jesus as a mythical person or idea. But what generally happens for those who are the most hardcore is they will spend most of their time attacking the sources. They'll attack the credibility of the authors, they'll attack the, attack the credibility of the text, and it just becomes a debate over whether or not we should take the sources seriously, whether or not we should accept the evidence. And that to me is not a very interesting debate. That to me looks a lot like the discussion that we have with creationists in that we see a world where evolution, ha well, we see a world with animals that have very similar characteristics, there's a theory about why those characteristics are similar and there is a theory, the theory of evolution, that accounts for the variation and the similarities that we see. And what creationists do is they just come along and they attack the evidence, they attack the scientists, they attack um, the, the publications and, and the concepts that are used to demonstrate the validity of the theory of evolution. And they don't produce their own theories. They don't try testing their theories out on the evidence. And that's kind of a similar structure that I see happening most of the times when it comes to debating whether or not Jesus was historical. The issue does not become whether or not there was an historical Jesus or not. The topic becomes whether or not the authors and the texts should be interpreted in one way, you know, as credible or not. Debating the credibility of sources and texts is not creating knowledge. It's just having a discussion and throwing out a lot of opinions. And I would like to promote the idea that the whole point of this is of scholarship and a scholarly debate and academic debate is to promote knowledge. What is knowledge? Well, by my definition, knowledge can refer to a theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. Knowledge acquisition involves complex cognitive processes, perception, communication, and reasoning while knowledge is also said to be related to the capacity of acknowledgement in human beings. How does back and forth over first century sources increase our knowledge about what was happening in the first century? I would say it doesn't. If the back and forth is not increasing our knowledge, then how do we increase our knowledge? Well, we do that by creating and testing theories. We would then take those theories and apply them to the evidence to see which theory best fits the available evidence. So let's just like talk about history as a, as a discipline. We can't know for certain whether or not there was an historical Jesus because we can't go back in time. We can't see things that happened. We don't have evidence in the, of the past. What we have are writings 
and we have the documentation that people produced at that time. So what we can know is what, or we can try to find out, is what these people thought about what happened. And the question is, do the is when we look at the evidence, when we look at all of the various writings involved in and around the Jesus movement in the first century uh, CE, do we see that a mythical Jesus theory better fits the perspectives, the changes, the theology, and the what people actually say in those texts? Or does an historical Jesus theory better fit what we observe in terms of attitudes and theology and Christology and whatever else in the text? Instead of debating whether or not we can trust the sources, we need to start debating the theories. We need to start testing the mythical Jesus theory and the historical Jesus theory. I have a very specific definition for theory that I'm going to be using. A theory provides an explanatory framework for some observation and from the assumptions of the explanation follows a number of possible hypotheses that can be tested in order to provide support for or challenge the theory. And this is the important thing. It's not enough to just say, oh, we've discredited the sources, therefore Jesus was mythical. You actually have to put forward testable statements that can be examined against not only the evidence in early Christianity, but also other societies. Do we see other examples uh, where this theory does fit and then look to see why it fits in those situations and then compare it to the first century Jesus movement and how well does it fit or not? Instead of having, as we saw before, a situation where we had the evidence and then people attacking the evidence, we're going to turn the model around. We use pretty much all the same images, but show you a different picture. This is what I would prefer to see in terms of our ex discussions around Jesus being a historical or mythical person. Instead of debating the evidence, we should be looking at a theory, looking at the model of the theory and understanding the implications of the model itself. From that model, whether it's a historic Jesus model or a mythical Jesus model, then we need to derive specific predictions based on that theory. So the idea isn't we you know, go along and we look for examples of things that fit a historical Jesus or a mythical Jesus, and we then go, oh, here's evidence. That's called confirmation bias. That's what creationists do, and that's what climate change deniers do. We have to have the theory, and it has to be coherent and make sense internally. And then the hypotheses that follow from it also have to make sense and be internally consistent. And what we then do is look at the predictions based on the theory, and then we look at the text, we look at the evidence to see whether or not it, the, ev the evidence better fits a worldview where we think the authors didn't think Jesus existed, or if the evidence in the text better fits a worldview where people thought Jesus was a historical person who lived and died and rose on the third day. And I think if you want to propose what actually happened in the world, then you're doing deductive approaches to you know, empirical testing. So deduction is reasoning that proceeds from general principles or premises to derive particular information. So the idea of a mythical Jesus should not only apply to Jesus. There should be a lot of other sort of mythical individual theories where all of the same predictions are made. And it's the same for an historical Jesus perspective. We would assume for people who existed in history, we would see similar um, predictions made about what kind of text should appear and what kind of debate should appear and what kind of evidence, what it might look like. And that is the point of using deduction, is that we're not going from observation and telling and doing confirmation bias. That's what Popper pointed out was the problem with Freud and Marx and Adler, was everything could be explained by the theory, and if everything could be explained by the theory, then nothing is being explained by the theory. So we need to have testable hypotheses that aren't just in particular situations, but have a truth that works within the theory itself. Using these theories, a researcher would create a hypothesis that could be investigated. To test that hypothesis, we operationalize the terms, we lay out what it would look like for these things, you know, what they would appear to us as if our hypothesis is being tested and our theory is true. And then the data is analyzed to determine whether or not the hypothesis fits what we observe, or if what we observe is ref refutes our prediction. At the end of the day, what we look to is the evidence. 
Evidence determines reality. Theories do not determine reality. And this is why I want to move the discussion from debating the sources to actually trying to understand what are inside the sources. Because the sources exist. The sources are evidence. That's the only evidence we have. And if we spend all our time debating whether or not it's credible, we're missing at the point, in my opinion. We're missing what people thought. And if people thought Jesus was real, then we should find evidence of that. If people thought there was no real person of Jesus, he was entirely made up out of whole cloth, then we should be able to find evidence of that, regardless of whether or not, you know, Paul wrote these letters or the other letters, the people who wrote those letters had a worldview. And I think that's where our emphasis and our investigations should lie. So how can we know whether or not people who were writing, men, let's be serious, men who were writing about Jesus in the first century CE thought he was a real person? This is a question that we can investigate by looking at history for examples of people that we agree were completely mythical and never existed, and people that we agree were historical and existed, and look at the characteristics of the writings around those two types of characters, you know, real characters, mythical characters or historical characters. And then we can look at the text, the writings around Jesus to see which side they fall on. Is it Are they more aligned with historical actual person or are they better aligned with mythical individuals? I have been on the record for a long time. I find the idea of an historical Jesus far more plausible than a mythical one based on the evidence at hand. And I'll give you a little preview of one element that makes up that general view for me. First, let's state the theory. So again, the theory is a logical explanation of the manner of interaction of a set of phenomena. And in this case, here is my theory of an historical Jesus. A Jewish man named Jesus was born in the gallery around the fourth century of the um, CE. He gathered a group of followers. He was killed by the Romans around 30 CE. After his death, his followers believed he rose from the dead and that he was the Messiah and or had become some sort of supernatural being. Either he was a supernatural being or he became a supernatural being. That is the historical Jesus theory. From this, models of interaction have to be developed, right? So we need a testable model of the manner of interaction of the phenomenon. In this case, what I would say is that for individuals who were historical and had were deified, that we would see characteristics about them that um, there's a progression of like ideas and writings and you know miracles attributed these types of things over time. And for a mythical person, we would also we would see different patterns, right? Because that idea wouldn't be based in an actual person, it would be fully formed from the start. The story itself would be complete before it's before it was kind of put out there for the world, whereas a person, their lives go on and things change, and their perspective changes. So I think we would be able to map out characteristics for non-existent gods, godmen, men who became gods, the various ways that the ancients thought about the world, and that there would be distinct differences from that to the historical person. And then the next step would be to test which structure of storytelling and progression better fits the Jesus um, movement, whether or not they, it looks more like something that's purely mythical, or if it looks more like something that came from uh, somebody who was a real person in history. So here the question is, you know, the falsifiable um, prediction, uh, do the writings of the Jesus movement look more like the historical men who were deified or non-existent men who were entirely mythical? And again, we could go through and do this. I don't because this is going to be a short video, but we could look at these characteristics and tick off which ones you know we could find on the list and look to see which side had more observations that matched. And then this would be evidence in favor of that particular theory. So we know from the writings of Paul that Paul met the brother of Jesus, James in Galatians 1. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him for 15 days. Abode with him. I, ah, that's like a new favorite word for me. I'm going to start aboding with people. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. We also know from Paul's authentic letters, actually the same authentic letter, that he did not like James at all. 
But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Paul here has no incentive to write something nice about James because Paul opposes James. James is trying to undermine Paul's gospel. And he's actually got some really persuasive counter missionaries to Paul's gospel because when Peter was hanging out with Paul, James's guys came by and talked Peter out of doing what Paul was saying Jesus wanted people to do. So, um, you know, if James has authority. Um, he also is uh, by Paul's own writing, the brother of Jesus. So the question here is, you know, from an historical Jesus theory, we put up this idea of a brother of the figure, the mythical figure or the historical figure. Is it normal for historical people to have siblings who outlive them? Yes, it is. Jesus had a brother named James who was a leader in the Jesus movement. Therefore, an historical Jesus is entirely consistent with this view of James being the brother of Jesus. For those who put a mythical Jesus theory forward, you would need to find some sort of evidence of a human being claiming to interact with the sibling of a non-existent mythical person. And this isn't, you know, some family in Rome that claims to be descendant of, you know, the person who founded the city. You know, Paul isn't talking about the brother of James who existed in a long time past. He's talking with them today. So how many contemporaneous sources do we have where a writer talks to the brother of the figure when that figure is non-existent? That would be evidence of the same weight on the mythical side um, toward you know their theory being right. What are the benefits to taking up this theory testing position rather than attacking and defending the sources position? Well, one, attacking the sources and defending the sources is just boring because people take up opinions and they just keep stating their opinions about why they don't believe somebody or why they do over and over and over. This adds nothing to our knowledge of what people were actually thinking in the first century. It adds nothing to our knowledge about uh, how people viewed Jesus in these texts that are right in front of us that we're not reading because we're so busy discussing whether or not the author should be taken seriously or not. The second benefit to taking a theory testing approach is that, you know, it's not just about opinions or preferences. If a theory doesn't explain the evidence, we throw away the theory. We never throw away the evidence. So by attacking the sources, by attacking the writers of the first century, all you're doing is taking away all our evidence. And then we can't have any knowledge because we have no basis. So I think that the theory testing is a way to better approach knowledge construction and to evaluate what idea more accurately maps onto what we observe. There are some really serious questions that I have for people who take up a mythical a purely mythical Jesus perspective. How does this help us understand why they're um, Paul's letters? How does it help us understand the sayings gospel? How do you have um, a collection of sayings from somebody who never existed? How does it help us understand the ending of Mark, a mythical Jesus? Why is there a progressive Christology where Jesus goes from becoming the Messiah at his resurrection, then at his baptism, then at his birth, and then finally pre-existing with God in the gospels? if everyone thought he was mythical. These are all the reasons why I think an historical Jesus theory makes a lot more sense because we see with Siddhartha Gautama, who becomes the Buddha, we see him starting off and the legends grow and you get different sects of people who see him differently and want to interpret his teachings in different ways. And I don't see that kind of sectarianism, those divisions, those theological disputes happening with mythological individuals. So I think that if you ask the question about the evidence and which theory better fits the evidence, we're going to do a much better job of progressing our knowledge and understanding these texts and what people in the text were trying to communicate much better. That about wraps it up for me in this little short video. I will be talking about the historical Jesus and the methods of determining whether or not Jesus was historical, how we can know and whether or not the methods are valid and rigorous in my September Patreon hangout uh, coming up. It's going to be on the 27th of September. 
at about uh, noon Eastern Standard Time, not about exactly noon Eastern Standard Time. And um, I will put links to all that stuff below. You don't have to contribute to my Patreon to enjoy it. You can just watch it for free. You can also uh, live and then you can see it later when I upload it. But if you are interested in having this discussion and thrashing these ideas out in a very structured sort of scholarly way, then come along over to my Patreon page. It's only a dollar a month to participate in the member hangouts and I would love to have you join us. So until a little bit later, I've been Christy. You are always awesome. Come on, let's face it. And I'll see you next time I do a video. Bye.